Reverend Roland is riding his horse over the hills of Wells, and he's looking down at the different villages, seeing the smokestacks of the homes where the families are staying warm. And he's tearing up, for he cannot think of a single house where Christ is not exalted and taught and believed in and trusted in. And he's thinking of the magnificent work of God, moving through and using his instruments of his grace and mercy, his ways of capturing people from, from the devil himself, and how so many have come to faith in Christ, and how beautiful and wonderful it is. It is very romantic, he thinks to himself. But not only in Wells, but in England there is a mighty work has been going on simultaneously in England and all the way into America, where the Wesley brothers and George Whitfield are advancing Christ's kingdom through their preaching and ministry and prayer. And what a close relationship Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield had established. And he thinks and ponders and wonders at all how simultaneously the Holy Spirit was moving and preparing people's hearts to hear the true gospel of Jesus Christ and how many have come to faith. Mr. Rollins heard that perhaps as many as 80% of the population of the New World, America, has heard George Whitfield preach at least one time. And he's thinking how gracious God is, because he remembers what life was like without God and how dark it was. How people gave, who believed that Christianity was only a fairy tale has come alive to them. And they have boldness and confidence and assurance in the historic facts and the testimonies of the apostles through the pure preaching of the word. It has become milk to them. It has become their milk and meat. And now Mr. Roland is in his 60s. And God has graciously blessed his ministry for a period of uh, close to 50 years now. And once again, he'll be preparing for the weekend services. And he labors just as hard in his 60s as he did when he began when he was a young man. His daughter's find it hard to pull their dad away from the study. His wife pleads with him to come to bed. But he needs to take every thought captive to Jesus Christ so that he could prepare his sermons for the people who are traveling 20, 40, 60, even up to 80 miles to hear this man preach. And so he wants to be faithful to God. He, he doesn't want any carnal, nothing of the flesh, nothing of his own wisdom, but all divine And so he takes it seriously. He takes it faithfully. And he wakes up Saturday morning, knowing that he's only a few hours away. And he's a bit unsettled. He feels as if he was just in his 20s, starting off in the ministry. So he runs down to the river. And he throws leaves into the rushing river. And he runs down the shore to to a finish line. And he says, ah, beat you when I was young beat you when I'm old, as if he's talking to Satan himself. But as he finishes and walks back to his home, he hears the echoes of the people singing hymns, for they're at the watering hole. They've gathered just a few miles away from Legaitha Wells, where they're going to have some uh, breakfast, time of fellowship. And he thinks of the beauty of it all as he hears the army marching in, thousands, mind you, coming together to worship Christ in spirit and truth. And so he returns to his home only a few hundred yards away from the chapel, and he puts on his black garment. And as the service begins at noon, people open up with a song of of hymns and singing praises, and Mr. Roland is standing in the back of the church, walking back and forth, back and forth asking and praying that God would meet with him once again, for Rollins never want to get in the pulpit without the Spirit of God being with him. And as he was pacing back and forth, and they would finish the final hymn, with solemnity he would walk up, the, the door would be open, and he would walk up into the pulpit. And then he would ask the people to sit, he would open up his Bible, and then it would begin.
Now meet with me, will you? In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. Now this scripture contains an affectionate address to believing Jews, entreating them to grow in faith and give due attention to God's words and the means whereby that growth is promoted. The apostle here exhorts them to hunger and thirst for the word of God, which is the food and nourishment of the soul. In the same manner as babes cry for their mother's breast, whose milk feeds and nourishes them. The words allude to two kinds of birth, one earthly and natural, implying that birth from our first parents, through whom original sin, like a poison, has defiled the whole human race. The other birth is heavenly and spiritual, implying that birth which is of God, through whom grace and holiness nourish and sanctifies our soul. And the last birth, God is our Father to beget us. The church is our mother to give us birth. The word of God is the means whereby we are begotten. The minister of the gospel are they who feed us. And the gospel itself is the breast which yields nourishment to our souls. We shall here to make five arguments. Our first being is what is the qualification required of those who wish to grow in grace? They must be as newborn babes. The second is what is the act of the mind in babes? What is it that they desire? Thirdly, what are we to desire? The milk of the word. And fourthly, what kind of milk? Oh, it is the sincere milk of the word. And fifth point, the object in view for desiring this milk is that we may indeed grow by it. Well, what is this qualification required to wish to grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, we must be as newborn babes. We know that babes are innocent and simple and harmless. This also should be the character of all who would be instructed in the word of God or be enlightened and comforted by the preaching of the gospel. We must be converted and become as little children before we can ever enter the kingdom of God. They who have the Lord Jesus to reveal unto him his will must be cleansed from all iniquity and sin. For as Satan will not dwell in the house where true religion reigns, so the Spirit of God will not dwell in any habitation which is not swept, cleansed, and garnished. As long as we do not desire new hearts, we cannot expect new blessings. Our preaching and our hearing will all be in vain, unless the veil of sin be removed and the light of the gospel shines in our hearts. If you wish that the Lord would bless your hearing and give success to our preaching, you must cast off the dregs of sin which sour your souls and the rust of sin which corrupts your heart. Lest instead of a blessing you receive a curse and lest the word of God, which should be a savior of life unto life, should be a savior of death unto death, as the unbelief of the Jews prevented Christ from working any miracles among them, so the bosom of sins of our hearts quench his spirit and close, as it were, his mouth. The prophet's counsel was to break up the fallow ground and not to sow among thorns, that is, among those worldly cares that spring up and choke the plants of instruction in truth to see the diligence of the farmer and perceive the carelessness of the Christian causes a good man to be grieved in his inmost soul. You may see many going to up to the house of God with an evil spirit in their hearts and many coming out with the curse of God upon their heads. Many spend more time to adorn their bodies to appear before men than they employ in prayer to sanctify their souls and prepare to come before God. Abhor these sinful practices, and long to be, not only as little children, but as little babes, having new hearts, new members, new desires, 
and new life engrafted in your soul. Abstain not only from one sin, but from all appearance of evil, so as to become other men, a new creatures in Christ Jesus. If you be attentive hearers, put away from your lust and your passions, and come as little children to hear the word of God. And if you would hear profitably, be sensible as little children, free from all prejudices, and separated from all sin. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and like newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. What is it we are to desire? We are not to be like wavering children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Neither are we to be children in knowledge and understanding. Brethren, says the great apostle, be not children in understanding, howbeit malice as infants, but understanding be as men. Neither then in understanding nor knowledge are we to be children, but as newborn babes we are to desire the sincere milk of the word. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. God satisfied the hungry with the good things, and the rich he sends empty away. When we are fervent in spirit and feel an actual desire and thirst after God's word, we may certainly conclude that we have a new life and a new spirit in us, and that every spark of religion is not utterly gone out, and that we are not wholly dead. It would be the same thing to desire the dead to quit their graves, as to see those dead in trespasses and sins desiring not the word of truth, leave their sins and save their souls. Many imagine the word can give life of itself, and hence seek not the Spirit of God, who creates the new birth and nourishes the new souls. Oh, they complain of the length of the service, and are best pleased with the shortest prayer, forgetting the sentiments of those saints who delighted in the law of the Lord and in his law meditated day and night. Oh, departed from the temple, but serve God with fasting and prayer night and day. They have no relish for God's word, no anxiety for salvation of their souls as newborn babes cry for their mother's breast as soon as they are born. So should Christians. As soon as they hear of new and another life hunger and thirst after the milk of the word. A child who is not fed could not live for three days, much less can our faith subset without being fed and nourished by the bread of life. Our Lord commanded that something should be given to eat to Jairus' daughter. As soon as, as he had raised her from the dead, that uh, it would be in vain to be revived by God's finger unless we are fed by the word of his grace. When God quickens us by his Spirit, we experience his grace implanted in our hearts. Christian, we should water it, lest it be scorched up like the seed which fell on rocky ground and withered away. We deem it a great miracle that Elijah lived forty days without food, but it is a matter of greater astonishment that souls should exist forty years without tasting of the bread of life. As our Lord was sent For to heal the ruler's daughter, when she was at the point of death, so many will not seek the prayers of God's ministers until they are arrested by the hand of death. They wish to die the death of the righteous, though they've lived the lives of the wicked. They now seek for repentance, whose offer they have been before despised. They delay building the ark until they are overtaken by the deluge. Lot tarried in Sodom until in a manner the angels forced him to depart. And in truth, it was God does not pluck us as brands out of the burning fire by his grace, and by his Spirit remove the veil of ignorance and darkness from our souls. Oh, none can be saved without it. Wherefore, if you've been planted in the true faith, see that you are also watered, for the best gifts will soon decay, if they are not moistened by the dew of heaven. As children eager for food, 
are the deaf to all excuses until they are satisfied. In like manner, it is not enough for you to desire the word, but you should be earnest and important in your prayers, that it should be engrafted in your hearts, that you may grow thereby. The word of Christ should dwell in us richly. It is not enough that we should remain for a while and then depart, but it must abide daily and continually in our hearts. It should be the food of our souls, morning, noon, and night, that through the ground may good, yet still needs the former and the latter rain, before it can ever bring forth much fruit. Some imagine that one shower, one sermon, or one prayer will abundantly water their souls. Not so, brethren. Ye must strive to enter the narrow gate. As newborn babies, ye must desire the sincere milk of the word immediately without delay. Oh, pressing on without weariness, cheerfully without mourning, constantly without ceasing, and perseveringly on to the end. Oh, what is it that we are to desire? The milk of the word, that is, the food and sustenance found in Christ Jesus. For this we are to labor more than any other food. Thus our Savior commands, Labor not, he says, for the meat that perishes, but for the meat that endures unto everlasting life. And although the word of God endures forever and is the incorruptible seed, which perseveres from famine and death, yet we desire many things before it. There is a carnal desire which wars against the soul. There is a desire for money, which is the root of all evil. There is the desire of retaliation, which springs from the spirit of revenge, and a desire of praise, which springs from pride. But few have a real desire for the sincere word of truth. Among the many blessings where the land of Canaan abounded, the chief was that it flowed with milk and honey. But the word of God abounds with far more greater treasures, bears higher titles, and holds out far greater promises. It is a lamp to guide our feet and a light onto our path. It is the medicine to heal our wounds and to bridle to our cheeks our pride. It is the milk to nourish and a wine to cheer. It is a sword to defend us on our journey home, and a key to open to us the gate of heaven. And as Elijah said to Naaman concerning the Jordan, wash in it, and be clean. So may we say with to all respecting the word of God, feed on it, live forever. It is the golden chain which brings God and man together. It gives us hope to cast down and impart the strength to the weary. It refreshes the heavy laden and gives eternal life to all believers. It speaks peace to the conscience. It gladdens the heart. It consoles the spirit and gives inexpressible joy in believing. Despise not the word of God, for by it now live, and by it you will be judged in the last day. And what is this nature and quality? It is called the sincere milk of the word. It is the milk in its natural state, not mixed with any error, not nor soured by any prejudice. And as our Savior admonishes us how we how we hear, so the apostle warns us to take heed what we hear. For as there is doctrine full of purity and truth, so also there is the doctrine full of leaven and malice. There is a communication which ministers grace to the hearers. And there is a communication that corrupts good manners. There is a word that edifies. And there is a word that eats like a wasting disease. There is a teaching of God and there is the doctrines of the devil. And it is once said, there is death in the pot. So it may also be said that there is death in the food. And for this reason, we are often enjoyed in scriptures to beware of false prophets who come to us in sheep's clothing, but inwardly no better than ravishing wolves. And not to believe every spirit, but that we are to try the spirits, whether they be of God. Many, like the prodigal son, feed on the husk of the swine. Here they do, but no good, driven about by many winds of doctrine, but neither grow in grace nor increase in knowledge. 
Truth can have no fellowship with error. Take heed lest unscriptural doctrines corrupt your heart and ruin your soul. To pretend to be worshiping God at church in the morning and carousing at the public houses in the evening cannot less than produce a canker in your bosom which must end in your death. And lastly, we, we are to consider the end view for this desiring the sincere milk of the word, which is that we would grow by grace. The design then is that we may grow in grace, grow in faith, and grow in righteousness. Believers are called the trees of righteousness. They are also called faithful servants who trade with their Lord's talents, that we may receive their own with usury. We are not always to be children, but we must henceforth increase in stature till we come to the fullness of Christ. We should walk forward in the path of duty until we come to the full good fruits of God. We must advance from grace to grace. We must not only go and hear the word, but we must need profit by hearing. We should be more zealous, more faithful, and more active for the truth than we have been in the past. We must be more holy, more fervent, and more diligent in religion in the future. It is to be feared that many who have long ago heard the word, yet still of little faith, of little love, of little patience, of little humility, that they have not yet seen Christ. Nay, several are still as dishonest towards their neighbors, as they are neglectful of the service of God, as proud in their hearts, as hypocritical at their church, and as sinful at their home as they have ever been. Oh, let this not be so. The reason is, they hear the word, but they do not grow thereby. But be assured, brethren, that it would have been better for you to have not heard the word in the first place than to not profit thereby. If the servant who hid his talent in the ground was cast into utter darkness, oh, what punishment shall be they be counted worthy who spend their talent upon their own pleasure? We should take heed that we hear, lest we receive the grace of God in vain. We should not only hear, read, mark, and learn, but inwardly digest it, that we may grow thereby. If you desire us of a blessing on the word of God, be sure to look up to the Lord and direct your prayers unto him. To preserve you in the spiritual conflict in which you are about to engage, separate yourself from the sinners while you seek for light to walk the narrow path. And when circumstances call you into their society, let your conversation resemble that of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. You may then hope that Jesus may be in your company. Do not deem it sufficient to be found within the walls of the church, but seek also to see Jesus there, that the word of salvation may effectually come to your heart. Be aware lest while ye trend his courts, you bring in vain gifts to God, an incense which is an abomination to the Lord. Take heed that the sacred flame which bathed been kindled in your heart, but not be put out by your sin. But let your prayer be a real burnt offering unto the Lord, a service acceptable in his sight. Improve your talents. Be ye doers of the word, that you may grow in grace, and may grace be multiplied through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And with tears in his eyes, Mr. Rowland would look around at the congregation to see how the word of God penetrated their souls. And he would lead them in a song of hymns. And then he would give the benediction. And then he would softly walk down from the pulpit out the back door, back to his house, where he would go into his bedroom to lay down. For the minister of God gave it his all for the sake of Christ. And that concludes Mr. Rowland's sermon. Until next week, may Christ be our most intimate companion. May prayer become our new daily necessity. And may scripture become our new language language of heaven. Grace upon grace be with you.